<laughs> All right, how you guys feeling today? There we go. You're satisfied, that's a good word. <laughs> satisfied. Well, let's go home then. We're done, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I've only been here for a couple of hours, but I would um, be lying if I didn't say that I am thrilled um, to be here. The student body is so impressive. Um, the questions that you guys have asked, the dreams that you guys are dreaming, um, the passion that you guys bring to the table, and the humility that you guys have um, has just been awe-inspiring. So thank you for having me. I guess I'm satisfied, too, <laughs> in my stomach. So anyways, today I have the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful opportunity to host a conversation with um, someone who has become a new friend. Um, literally, James and I uh, met this year probably a couple of months ago. Um, and James is a one-of-a-kind individual. So James represents Ashley Stewart, which is um, a brand that represents clothes for plus-size women. What's phenomenal and unique about James is he understands who his core audience is. And even though the core audience doesn't look anything like James, I don't know if I've seen anybody who champions and fights for that audience like I've seen in this man. And so, anyways, James, I'm gonna bring you up to do your own introduction, but if you guys can please welcome James to the stage. So James, I'm going to ask you to do two things before we uh, bring our other guest up, which is one, tell them a little bit about yourself, and then two, I think you have a nice little, little announcement to make. I do, and I'm so glad you're here. The fun factor just went up about 20, <laughs> 20, 20x. Like, um, so I, I'm married, I have three girls, I live in Boston, <clears throat> and um, you know, I'm a college grad, law school grad who never practiced who spent most of his career uh, investing in money in private equity growth type companies. Um, I find myself running Ashley Stewart, which is one of life's great twists, mm -hmm. but it feels very right at the same time. And I'm a former high school teacher, and that's my life. Very well. You want to make your special oh, announcement now? So today has nothing to do about Ashley Stewart, but it has everything to do about Ashley Stewart, right? Uh, we are, as a former high school teacher, education has always been very important to me. And it's the one thing my parents really, really pushed on us. Uh, they were immigrants here, and that's really the only thing that we had was, was learning. So we're proud today to announce that uh, we're going to award a $10,000 scholarship. How much money? So I think it's $10,000 $10, scholarship, mm -hmm. but there's more. Okay. It's uh, through a and t and I'm sorry, fellas, this one, given Ashley's, is for the ladies. <laughs> there are certain scholarship requirements that you'll see on the website. It's going to get announced on Monday. Um, but it's a leadership award. We want to award a woman leader and give her $10,000 for next spring's tuition. And you have to come to New York. We'll, we'll fly you up. And uh, you have to receive the award on September 16th at the King's Theater, which is this historic theater in Brooklyn. And you have to receive it, I'm hoping, from Pat in front of 3,500 guests. And there will be many celebrities and Ashley Stewart customers, and that's part of the deal. And you're going to have to speak to 3,500 people about yourself and about why you deserve to win the award. So we, we couldn't be more delighted to be able to do this with a and Awesome. Now, ladies, I expect you to be screaming louder because it's for you. <laughs> Let them know how you feel about that free money, right? <laughs> All right, so thank you, James. That's phenomenal. Again, um, just another great example of what he as a leader is doing um, and how he is taking passion and purpose in everything that he does um, and really against an audience and a consumer base that doesn't necessarily look like him, but he's got so much heart for it which is phenomenal. Uh, the next guest that I'm happy to introduce you to, who I just had the pleasure of meeting um, earlier this week, which is Pat Miller-Zahler. Um, so you guys know her because she represents a and through and through and um, is on the board here. But um, she's an amazing woman, so amazing that on the way here, I sat next to, some, to a lady who uh, started speaking to me. And she said, I told she said, what are you going to North Carolina for? I said, oh, I'm going to A&T. The very next sentence out of her mouth was, you need to meet Pat. 
Zoller. I said, well, interesting <laughs> enough, she and I are having a conversation today. So I'm going to welcome up this woman whose network and influence crosses the globe and the nation so much so that I couldn't even come to this city without meeting someone who loved her. Um, Pat, if you can come up and introduce yourself to the folks. Thank you very much, Natavio. And um, it's so great to be here with James. But um, even more importantly, it's great to be home. Mm -hmm. This is home for me. This is where it all came together. James was actually just asking me, you know, you know, how did I feel about now, many years later, having gone to A&T, and would I make the same decision? I would make the same decision again and again and again, because it is very clear to me that without A&T, none of the other stuff I've done would have been possible. So I am um, delighted to actually, this Big Ideas Conference came about because one of the things that I realized is that you know, a and students were not lacking in skills, they were not lacking in, um, in ambition, but they were lacking in just exposure to certain things, certain things like private equity. And we'll talk more about this, but James and I both know that private equity is a really, really great industry. It is a great business. Not only do you have the opportunity to buy companies and make them better, because that's fundamentally what you have to do generally in private equity, but it is a business that is really, really lucrative. And so as a consequence, private equity has most of the time been a little bit of a cottage industry where you know people that look like you or me didn't have access to it, and that's just not fair. And so one of the reasons for this Big Ideas Conference was to actually start to bring these ideas for you to understand that private equity is fueling a whole industry of kind of great ideas. It's fueling a whole industry of new opportunities for your jobs. And so wherever you sit at this school or wherever you sit, wherever you are, you are, you're coming from, you should be thinking about private equity as a viable option uh, for your career going forward. And so just a little bit more on me, uh, the, on the background. So graduated from A&T in 1984. I just graduated uh, off the board in 2015, the last two years of my eight year service, I was chair of the board of trustees. Again, just a great way to give back to this university and I encourage any of you that, you know, post graduation, if you're able to give back to A&T, please take every opportunity to do it because, you know, for a school that gives so much to each one of its students, it's really the least that, that any of us can do. But I, uh, I graduated from here, I uh, became a CPA, I left uh, here and went to Dallas and worked for one of the big accounting firms. I left Dallas and went to Harvard Business School to get my MBA. And since that time, I've worked on Wall Street in some form or fashion. Private equity is something that I'd kind of known about a little bit at business, business school, but it was still a pretty small industry. And it was not until about 10 years ago that I got the opportunity to work in private equity. I work at a company called Newberger Berman, who is fantastic because they are, they've sponsored this event. You know, they allow me to come and do these types of things. So shout out to Newberger. Uh, always appreciate their support of me and supporting the things that are really important uh, to the industry, the things that are, support, that are important to who we are as a firm. So uh, my business uh, within our private equity uh, group at Newberger is focused on investing in funds, is focused on investing in the companies, investing in private companies, uh, is focused on um, you know, providing the debt for some of these companies. So it's a full gamut of private equity uh, investments that I do within my portfolio. And about a year ago, uh, one of the firms that I'd invested in uh, was having an annual meeting. And one of the things they wanted to talk about uh, were the really successful companies that they had, companies where uh, that had been sold for a lot of money, therefore, therefore creating a lot of money in my portfolio in which I'd invested. And um, as they were talking about this one firm out on the West Coast, talking about uh, their exits and the companies that have been successful, they mentioned Ashley Stewart. And of course I knew Ashley Stewart. I mean, uh, you know, I live in Harlem, uh, the flagship stores on 125th Street. And I was like, this is kind of interesting. Ashley Stewart is part of the portfolio. And as I heard more, and part of that was James Reed getting up and talking, not just about the financial piece of it, which is important, mm -hmm. but really the soul of the company. And we'll talk more about that today, but you know, it turned out that you know, this 
atypical person had been the CEO of this company. <laughs> it was in my portfolio, and I was thinking about what we do for big ideas. And so, again, we talked a lot today about connecting these dots, but to me, this was kind of divine intervention, and it was just a story that needed to be told. So really happy to be here tonight, and um, I can't, can't wait to talk more. All right, very good. So before I jump into the questioning, I think I'm going to try to set a little rules for some call and response today. Clearly, you can cheer anytime you want, but I'm going to build in a way for us to cheer. So every now and then, I might just mention again that the fact that Ashley Stewart has decided to give a, a scholarship for $10,000 to somebody on this school. And every time I say that, I just want y'all to think I have an opportunity to get free money and then respond. So let's try it. Ashley Stewart is giving away $10,000. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right, perfect, perfect, perfect. OK, so first, let, let, first let's start out talking about success. Um, I think both of you guys have very successful backgrounds. Um, by any definition, chairman and CEO, managing director, people would say that you two are very successful. So my first question is, um, how do you define success? Ah. So for those of you who are in my <coughs> class today, right, I think as you get older, I think the quicker you can become old in a young person's body, the better off you'll be. Mm -hmm. And there are certain things about a life in school of hard knocks and you start learning things. This is how I would tell my 20-year-old something what success was. It's to be healthy, to have a really great family, and a really great set of friends to rely on when things are good and bad. And when things are good, these same friends should be the ones telling you you're not that good. Okay? Um, and to, it's to make, it's to not covet things, but to be comfortable. But to always try to achieve the best. But in a way that brings everyone along for the ride. My dad used to say, and I finally got it. This was something like 10 years ago. I was right. I was a young, young guy trying to make up the ranks of private equity. I was one of the early guys in private equity in Boston, right? You work hard, 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 and, and you, that's what you're taught to do. But what he said to me is, you will achieve great success when other people really want you to be successful, and they're really happy for you that you are <coughs> successful. And if you think about how profound that is, and you think about tonight, mm. it's a great event, but we have a lot of friends. You're here, Newberger, Batavio, Revlon, Cream of Nature, Facebook is helping with the marketing and streaming this. There are a lot of friends that help get this together, and it's, it's a group of companies that would not have normally been together to do this, but that one little conversation mm -hmm. we had in California, it spawned all of these relationships, and we said, why wouldn't we all rally around this and do this together? I define this as success, like tonight's a night that I think, like today, that I remember 50 years from now, God willing that I'm still alive, but 50 years, I'll remember today. Mm. Very nice. That's Pat. success. So, yeah, no, that's, that's all. I'd say amen to all of that, James. <laughs> um, for sure, um, true success always has to be more about just yourself. Because if it's just about how much money you make or how, much mon how many things you acquire or who's, you know, kind of, you know, reading your, you know, your, your tweets, that's just not enough, right? I mean, success, I mean, I think about it, I mean, I, I, you know, you have to go to, um, you know, to the, you know, to, to, to scripture here, right? Success really has to be about more than yourself, not just success, but like, have you been significant? Mm -hmm. Have you impacted someone else's life? You know, what are the things when, you know, when, again, as I get closer and closer to this time, when I'm sitting on the porch, you know, with my little girl who will be grown up then, what are the things that I'm going to remember then? Mm -hmm. What are the things that I'm going to really think were important? It's not going to be this, uh, you know, the, again, you know, the deal that I worked on or how much money I made, but it's going to be stuff like this. I mean, success is really trying to take yourself as much as you can out of the equation and think about how you are impacting others. Very good. So now I'm, I'm, I'm going to try my best to ask the questions that you guys are probably thinking. And so my next response to that, okay, so I didn't grow up with a lot of money. 
Um, when I was in college, I probably had even less money. I don't know what's, low, what's lower than broke, but that's what I was in college, <laughs> right? And so in college, when I was you know, um, the age of many of the people in this room, money was a big component of what success looked like. Yet neither one of you guys mentioned money in your conversation. Why is that? Where did money go? Did money fall out of the equation? You got so much money, you don't care about it. Where is money in your, in your equation? So we grew up with no money. And uh, my, you know, I, I tell this story, my first job out of, uh, so my dad immigrated here and my mom did too. Worked very hard. And, you know, I, I went to Harvard College. My dad was saying, now what are you going to do? Mm. Are you going to go and go to make m a lot of money? And I said, Dad, I'm, I'm going to go teach high school for a bunch of underachieving kids and coach football and make $12,600 a year. Mm. So after he picked himself back up <coughs> the floor and said, excuse me, what are you doing? Um, I said, Dad, this is what, to Pat's point about being impactful, I can't think of anything more impactful than being a teacher. And these were kids that were just on the cusp, right? They were, should I go to college, should I not? But lo and behold, what, what happens is when you follow your heart and you, um, the reason why I like private equity is that at its best, not all private equity, but at its best, good private equity, you can save and create a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. You can impact families and create stable and growing companies. Um, teaching was probably the best thing that I've ever done in my career. It's made me a much better investor because for me, even though, yeah, I'm good with the counting, the math, and all of these things, but as my team here knows, I read people and care about people tremendously. And I look for people who, I, I, I can see management teams. I read people's emotions, like what are you scared of? What are you confident in? And it's made me a better investor. So if you can marry numbers <clears throat> and not lose people, you will be successful. And yes, have I, have I been able to pay off my law school debt? I showed you what my balance sheet looked like at age 27. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> Assets, zero. Yeah. Student debt? So much. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but you sort of just, you, you just put your head down and, and it, it tends to work out, but you have to make sure you're with and surrounded with good people. Mm. And then it's not so lucky. The, the hardest decision you'll have is to surround yourself with the right people. Mm. And that group of people, you'll be successful. So I'll take a little bit different tact on the money. So money is important. Let's let's make no mistake about it. Y'all can say, it. "Man, I know y'all." Yeah, no, okay, yeah. money, money is now. Every time you're gonna say ten thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, yeah, yeah. Free yeah. Free money. Yeah. Okay. So okay. again, uh, money can yes. actually give scholarships, exactly. right? Money can do a lot of things, and but I think the point of money, mm. you, the pursuit of money, just for money itself, mm. leaves you really empty. Uh, working on Wall Street for as long as I did, one of the things that Wall Street is famous for is the day you get your number. Everybody talks about the day you get your number, the day you get your bonus. And bonuses can generally be two, three, four, or even more times your salary. And so what I found early on was that, you know, you get that, you know, everybody's talking about that number, everybody's talking about that number, and the day you get it, that day you're happy, and you're happy for like that one day, and then the next day, if you don't like your job, you're miserable again. And so money just, money just, in pursuit of money itself is not enough. But if you start to think about money as part of kind of your legacy, you know, kind of what you can actually leave here and what can be here past you, again, how you might you be able to endow a and like Willie Deese, my friend, has done here, you know, how you might be able to create scholarships at a, at a historically black college like a and if you start to think about money in the context of the good that it can do for the institutions and the people and the things that need it and that you care about, it actually gives you more purpose around it and it gives you, the, and you're in pursuit of it, you're trying to do it in the context of hopefully a broader career, but in the context of how can you have an impact on others. Beautiful. I agree with that. So great note, so there's this, this, this common thought between the two of you about money being a tool um, money being able to enable you to do things. And so, but there's another thought that you have to be chasing something bigger. And so I'll ask you a big question. What is the, what is the role of purpose 
in your pursuit in life? Do you believe in purpose? Do you think you know what your purpose is? Are you able to carry out your purpose in the roles that you are in and perhaps the money that you have amassed to this date? For me, as I think back, so I am, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am. <laughs> but it's um, older than you think. Uh, when my pr I think my purpose in life, other than for my wife and my, my, my three daughters, mm. um, I've never stopped being a teacher, ever. You know, I, and I think my purpose is to be able to see things, complex things, mm. but then to crystallize them into a way that everyone can understand those things and I teach it. And it, I did it today in class, mm -hmm. right? It's, life, is, life is very difficult if you overcomplicate things, and so is in investing, anything is, like a golf swing or tennis, any, anything is complicated if you overcomplicate it. It's, that's my purpose, is that I'm, I'm like a born teacher, I believe, and I, I happen to wear an investor's hat sometimes. Right now I'm also a CEO hat but I'm always wearing the teacher hat because I just want other people who are younger than me or who are my age to not have to learn the way I learned it. It was, no one ever gave it to me. Mm. It's more just saying, this is a school of hard knocks. I got beat up a lot, you know, this is what happened. Like, here, don't do this, do this, it works. That's my purpose. So I think purpose is a um, perpetual pursuit. I think that uh, for me, it has been, you know, at each stage in your life, I think your purpose can look very different. Mm. In the early stage of my career, my purpose was very much to be the very best I could be in that seat and in that, in that job at the time because that was going to allow me to do the next thing. Now, as I think about my purpose, my purpose is to certainly create value for my clients um, to, but again, it gets back to this impact. Part of my purpose now is I have a five-year-old daughter. You know, my purpose is to be, you know, a great wife to my husband, to create a great family, to help to, you know, for her to grow up and to be, you know, just strong young woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I think of my purpose as, you know, as part of the, my, you know, my growth and my, you know, my quest and my thirst for knowledge at kind of each stage in life. And I think, you know, 10 years from now, I think I'll be in a different place. My little girl will be a teenager by then and not wanting to talk to me at all, probably. Mm -hmm. So I'll need to, you know, I'll need to be thinking about other things. But I think of purpose, I put it in the, in the bucket of, it's like, are you growing and are you learning? Yeah. And the purpose basically continues to reveal itself at each stage in your life. Very nice. Um, so as you guys talk about purpose, there's a certain self-awareness, right, that comes mm -hmm. with being able to have the conversation you just had, whether it's James identifying his purpose as being a teacher, a consistent teacher, regardless of what hat he has on, for you, purpose as a moving target, but something that as you evolve, it kind of changes and you step into. There's this notion of self-awareness, and in the branding workshop, we had this conversation about how a lot of times um, we are externally focused, right? We have an external disposition. We're looking at Mark Zuckerberg and saying, he made billions of dollars doing X, I want that, right? And what you guys are talking about has a self-awareness that starts inside. So talk to me about the role of self-awareness um, in terms of enabling you to be successful and maybe um, how you have come to be self-aware over the years. Look, I think the hardest thing in life is to be 100% self-aware and self-accepting, which is one of the reasons why I love Ashley Stewart as a brand, by the way, okay? Mm -hmm. I think it's, I'm very proud of the brand as it relates to my three daughters, for instance, and all the messages our brand conveys to women. It takes a long time. Uh, I think that for me it helped having kids about being really self-aware, about really being a fiduciary, and knowing that I'd put my body in front of a truck for my kids and not even think about it. And then when you get that self-aware, it's, um, it's really acceptance of your weaknesses too. And the ability to show, be hum hum humble, to show vulnerability, but always to the right people. And if you start really accepting, I'm really good at these things, 
I wish I were better at these things. I'm never going to be the best, mm -hmm. but I'm going to find people who are the best. Mm -hmm. I'm going to partner with them, and we're going to win as a team. That's when you really start winning. I think that early on in your 20s, teens, because everyone, you're, I was talking to a couple guys, right? We're going to, and then we're going to. I'm like, yeah, you're going to. Mm -hmm. But also breathe, right? And you, you can have that shot. It may take another 10 years. Mm -hmm. You just got to keep learning and learning and make some money, mm -hmm. pay down some debt, have some savings, de-risk your life a little bit, meet some more people that are like-minded, and then maybe you take your shot with that group of people, and it's not just you. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's, that's <coughs> an important life lesson, I think. Javio, I do think that self-awareness is a really tough thing. And um, I think that when you're in your teens, and you're in your early 20s, it can be very, very hard to really see yourself the way other people see you. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the reasons I think that sometimes early marriages don't work out is not because of that other person, it's because of you. You don't actually know enough of yourself yet mm -hmm. and don't own enough of yourself yet to be able to give to someone else. Yeah. And so um, here are some of my lessons for you know kind of becoming self-aware. So first off is actually starting to just, uh, just pay attention to subtleties. It's like there's a there's a there's a um, expression that I heard on Wall Street that said, if everybody is saying you're ugly, actually maybe you are ugly, right? <laughs> so you have to like you have to listen. I mean, so that's an extreme example, but it just goes to show that you should actually seek out feedback. You should seek out feedback. Feedback is is a blessing. Anyone that takes the time to actually observe you, watch you in different situations and that's willing to give you kind of honest feedback, that is a blessing. And you being in a position where you welcome it and you know, seek it out, actually that is a great way of actually starting to see things about yourself that maybe you don't, you don't, you don't always see. So mm -hmm. I think you know, in a you know, self-awareness around what things work for you and what don't, you have to be willing to take some, take some risks. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the ways too to become more self-aware. You know, you take some risk here, and you see how that works out. You do something else over here. Being flexible, adjusting, um, not being so hard on yourself. Another thing about self-awareness. I mean, I think one thing, too, is that, especially early on, I mean, we can be so hard on ourselves, afraid to make a mistake, you know, because we think any mistake is the end-all, be-all. We can't recover. Give yourself, give yourself a chance. Give yourself a chance to take risks. Life is supposed to be about taking some risk. I mean, try to, you know, try to, you know, mitigate them as best you can. Take, you know, some off the table as you can over life. But take risks. Don't be afraid to take risks because this is, again, how you get to know yourself a lot better. This is how you start to understand what you do well and what, and ultimately what that purpose might be. I mean, your point, we talk a lot about at Ashley Stewart, the concept of kindness. And when I first said this, and this was, you have to imagine, it was at the bleakest moment, mm -hmm. right? So we're selling scrap metal to make payroll. No one believes in any of this that's happening. I talked about kindness, and people said, they laughed, and they thought it meant niceness, and it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Kindness is much closer to love, which is, it's very strong, and it's the feedback comes very swift. If you're negative and positive, and I agree with you, like it's very important to find people that you trust enough that will give you very direct feedback, particularly people who give you feedback you do not want to hear, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? If the intent is good and they're saying, everyone's saying this about you, they're right, you're not. Mm -hmm. You wanna find those, mm -hmm. it sounds backwards, but you wanna find those people who actually care enough about you to say uncomfortable things, because then they don't really care about you. They, they actually care about you because they're willing to, to do it. True. Find those people, they're not many. You will, you will mm -hmm. find they're far and few between in your professional <clears throat> life. You find someone in business that will do that for you, you stick with them. All right, so we're going to take it out of the 50,000 foot and bring it a little bit down, and I'm, but I'm, I'm going to stick in this um, space about self-awareness. Um, I once had a professor um, tell me so clearly what he thought he was good at. So he was a serial entrepreneur, 
and his comment to me was, Datavio, I'm not the best at starting a company. So when a company's got zero products and zero millions in revenue, that's not really where I thrive. I need a company to have about 50 employees, $2 million on the books. That's where I come in and I start kicking butt and taking names. And then it gets to a point where it's now 200 million on the books. It's a little bit bigger than the place that I typically like to thrive. It's time for somebody else to take over. Very clear about the space that he felt like he was best in the world at. So my question to you is, in terms of being self-aware, do you know what that spot is for you? Do you know that space? Can you speak to that space for yourself? <clears throat> sure. So I would say, um, just on a granular level, I am really good at taking a good idea and making it great. Mm. Really getting behind an idea and helping to execute on it. Not starting with the one that's just kind of more pie in the sky. I'm definitely much more of, you know, kind of the granular idea. How do you kind of take it to the, net, to the next level? The other thing I would say, you know, kind of around this is kind of connecting the dots. Mm. I think that either connecting people, connecting these dots with this kind of conference kind of coming together, mm -hmm. I am, um, I can hear, you know, part of it and then connect the rest of it. So I would say, um, and again, because I'm an Aggie, and Aggies do, um, <laughs> the, the, the execution piece, I'm especially strong on. All right, beautiful. Mm -hmm. So the name of my investment firm that I started seven, eight years ago is called Fire Pine. And what a, this is symbolic. What a fire pine is, it, it's a pine cone that on its surface, it looks defective. It never seeds anything because inside the pine cone, the seeds, they're trapped in wax. And so the seeds can't come out. But when there's a forest fire and everything else burns, this wax protects these seeds and the wax gradually melts and it's these seeds that re-sprout forest. And that's the way I live my life, both as a teacher and as an investor and as a human being. I don't judge anything on surface, ever. People, financial statements. I look at situations and people, and I go right to core value of a company, core value of a person, and I say, hey, why are you spending time here. You're so good here. You're the best. Let's go. And then I've learned over 20 years business. I, now I have the business to rewrite things. And so I don't know what that is. It's called, it's really like impactful investing or inflection point, inflection point right. investing where you have something and then I grow it mm -hmm. because the tree starts growing because it's focused <coughs> on the right thing. So if you didn't take notes, you guys should all take notes because I think what's important for me and what both, neither one of them said, I'm a banker. Neither one of them said, I'm a finance guy, right? They are giving you things that they are great at that can cross over. If you are a grower or if you are an executor or a good to great mate, you can apply that gift in so many ways. Um, so in, the takeaway for me is not to chase the thing. I want to be a marketer. I want to be, it's to chase whatever it is that you are best in the world at and then you can always find ways to apply that overall. Um, okay, so let's go back to success, but we're gonna stay tactical. Um, so another analogy that I talk to people about is um, Kobe Bryant, right? Who knows who Kobe Bryant is? <laughs> Ashley Stewart giving away $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Kobe Bryant, right? So they used to tell all these stories all the time about how Kobe Bryant would um, be the first person in the gym, or you hear like the Michael Jordan, they're the first person in the gym, they're the best person on the team, but they're the first person in the gym. Practice starts at seven, they're there at five. Why is that? It's because Kobe knows, does Kobe like getting up and being in the gym at five o'clock? Probably not, right? But Kobe knows that if I trust this process, if I'm the first person in the gym, if I shoot two hours longer than everybody else, if I dribble more than every, then I will be the best in the game, right? And so there's this notion of, um, understanding that it's not always easy, but that you have to trust the process, and if you have the right process, you will get there. So my question to you guys is, your keys to success, what is the process? If you are gonna tell these people out here, all right, trust the process, do these three things, do these five things, and again, maybe not in a year, you said you, you gave them a 10 year <coughs> horizon, right? Maybe in 10 years, what is that process? Yeah, 
Should I go to Pat? Because you may yeah. have, okay. Okay, so <laughs> luckily I have it here. I you have, um, and I've been, <laughs> <laughs> I got you. I forgot. I've been, um, I've been fine tuning this. When I, I turned 40 a couple of years ago, <laughs> not a couple of years ago, many years ago, I decided to, um, I thought a little bit about, um, you know, what were, again, this idea of being self-reflective, this idea of like making sure you understand yourself. So I decided to kind of, think about what were the things that I thought in my life had worked best. Mm -hmm. And I decided to call them my five P's, because P, Pat, and to try <laughs> to you know, synthesize it into, a, into something that I thought really summed up you know, the things, the decisions that I thought I'd done well, and actually highlighted some of the things that I'd not done so well. And so where did it start? It actually starts a little bit with your first question, Natalio. <laughs> it's uh, you know, discovering the passion giving yourself time and giving yourself the opportunity to discover what your passion is. And so what is the passion piece? The passion is what are you really better at than most anybody else? What's kind of God given for <coughs> you? What are the things that when you, you know, when you're doing them or when you produce them, people say you are really, really good at that. So giving yourself a chance to discover your passions. And if you grew up like I did in little Lylesville, North Carolina, which is 500 people then and now, you know, the idea was who thought about passion? Everybody was talking about how do you just get food on the table, right? There was no time to kind of discover, you know, there was no time for discovery. And so it took me a little while to even give myself permission mm -hmm. to really understand what my passions are. And so, and then to realize that over time, just as I said earlier, those will evolve, but I need to be completely open to the fact that at each stage of my life, that passion might, might, look, might look very different. And then the next part of that is kind of what I call paying attention to the details, especially early on in your career. Paying attention to the details means that whatever that passion is, you pursue it with gusto. You try to be really, really good at it. You're really good at the details of it. And so what does it mean you know, when you're kind of building your brand early on, it means that when you're working on a team, people can count on you to do things. People know that when you do this thing, it's actually going to be really, really good. It's part of your passion, and so again, the details of it really matter a lot. People know that when you do it, there's not going to be errors in it. People know that when you do it, you're gonna to come to it with a huge amount of passion and a huge amount of energy to do it right. Number three is after you've kind of you know, discovered this passion and pursuing the passion and actually paying attention to the details, the third P is actually having a point of view. And that's kind of the next stage, basically. So again, you're, you're doing your work well, the paying attention to the details is you've got your head down, doing a great job. At some point in your career, you have to poke your head up and have a point of view about what you're doing in relation to the whole what you're doing in relation to the whole of the company. How is what you're doing impacting this larger company? How is what you're doing making this company more successful? How is what you're doing impacting the people or the institutions that you care about? Having a point of view, like will this company, the company you're working for, what are the headwinds that it's facing? What are the growth opportunities? Having a point of view around that will actually start to dictate a little bit as well around the directions that you should be going in life. This point of view about what you're doing in relation to the whole. The fourth P is something we talk a lot about, but I think I certainly did not pay it enough attention early on because I thought those other three things were enough, just being the smart girl who was, you know, who, you know, was really passionate and produced really great work. The fourth P is the people part building the relationships, mm -hmm. understanding people, the EQ part of the equation. Because if you just lead always with just the hard skills and you don't take time to build relationships, it's good, you're gonna be limited as to how, how far you can go. At the end of the day, people hire people that they like, they pay, pay people that they like, they want people on their team that they like. All of these are relationships. The reason that networking oftentimes gets a bad name is that networking in and of itself can feel one way. You show up you know, and see me, you think I've got this big job, I can do something, you ask me for something, and, you know, and it just ends there. 
Networking should be about building relationships. Relationships by their nature have to be two ways. It can't just be one way because if it is, people, you know, that's not, that's not the way you build something that's sustainable because the, you know, people always get really tired of that. Um, the fifth P is the persistence part of it, right? You think, you know, again, especially coming out of college, especially for many of you, many of you have probably never failed. Many of you have probably, most of the stuff you did because you worked hard, you're here at a great college, you're doing well, you probably don't know what failure is. Failure will happen. Failure, and we'll talk some more about that. Failure will happen and sometimes it'll be larger and more you know, stupendous than you ever thought it could be. The thing about, about failure is the persistence that you show in coming back, being willing to just show up the next day after you've had this spectacular failure it's amazing the kind of credit that you get for that. So persisting, even in the face of, you know, of something that was tragic and that was a failure on your part, can get you a huge amount of credit. And it means that you're willing, you're willing to just kind of keep pushing along. And so I think about these five Ps as kind of the power. I think of your power as kind of God-given and so nobody can really take it away from you. But you give up your power when you don't treat people right give up your power when you are not self-aware, you don't show up in the right way, but thinking about your five Ps is really kind of, the, that's the, those are the insights that, that have, have carried me to the next level. I, I love all of that. I'm gonna yeah. try to power through three questions before I run out of time. Um, one is gonna be for each one of you and the, the first one's for both of you. Um, and I'm gonna piggyback off of where you just left, uh, Pat. Um, I think we would do this group and this room a disservice if we just talked about being successful. That's the easy stuff to talk about, right? Um, but let's talk about failure. So for both of you, my <clears throat> question is, tell me a time when you failed and how did that failure play a role, contribute to the person that we see on this stage today? My biggest failure was Ashley Stewart. So I've spent my whole life in Boston in private equity. And when you're in private equity, your job is to invest in businesses and you have management teams that run the businesses. You don't run it yourself. The last time I worked in retail, I was a busboy in Port Jefferson, Long Island, which was the second job I had after washing dishes at Red Lobster, okay? I was part of an investment firm that made an initial investment in Ashley Stewart to save it once. And I left that firm I was away, and the firm didn't, the, Ashley Stewart still didn't do well. And it was my worst investment I've ever made. Mm. And they asked me at that point, the board, do you know anybody that really cares about this company, the customers, the employees, is a private equity person that can operate, does distressed venture, and is a teacher? <laughs> no. Don't know anyone like that, right? <laughs> like, are you asking me to shut down my life in Boston to jump into this burning house? Yeah. I said, okay. So I didn't want this company to fail. I didn't want these jobs to go away. You know, there were like a thousand jobs, mostly in urban neighborhoods, mostly women. And so I came down the first day, I said, I'm the least qualified person to run this company. This is why I love the brand who's gonna help me. I need your help. And it's turned into, and I begged for money because no one wanted it. And so I made some phone calls and, but first I asked the employees, do you want this? We want it. Good, let's go. And since then we, it's kind of a miracle, we're, we're on borrowed time. I mean, the fact that we're even here together, mm -hmm. this never should have happened. This business should have been gone four years ago, mm -hmm. thousand jobs gone. But we've some, and the company had no Wi-Fi. Stores didn't have connectivity. It was, but today we're sitting here today mm -hmm. and it's become one of the things I'm most proud of. of course. It's a group of very ordinary people who banded together with know-how and we fought. And we're sitting now, you know, we're on the stage with Macy's and Walmart and like, and 
I'm so proud of it. So it's really just uh, really proud. I'm really happy for the employees and the customers that have supported this brand for 20 years. It just I wake up every morning and I just mm -hmm. feel responsive. I'm like, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Anyway, so that's my greatest failure, mm -hmm. and yet it's also greatest success. One of you know a really really good success. Yeah. But for a large community of people, million women we talk to every day. It's mm -hmm. not my. It's a million women succeeding right now. Mm -hmm from our biggest failure, or my biggest failure. Very nice. Pat? Yeah, no, so many. Let's, uh, <laughs> you know, that's if you live long enough, there will be many. I mean, I think the lesson from my failure is that you have to be willing to let a door close mm. for another door to open up. And so mine, my failure was actually, I was working, you know, again, I've told you, I'm from Lylesville, North Carolina. My first job was picking peaches. And then I got promoted to kind of grading peaches. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to New York City and I'm working for these big investment banks, this is actually something that I could have never even dreamed of growing up in my little small town. And then, you know, I start off with one big Wall Street firm. And then I get to the one that's got the best name, mm -hmm. the best brand mm -hmm. of any firm on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And I'm like so excited to be there. I mean, to me, Every single way my car could be punched, that firm punched it, right? Mm -hmm. It was like, I have arrived, yeah. right? And so the first few years were fine. But then I look up, you know, kind of seven after being there seven years, and I realize I'm not happy at this firm. I'm not happy with what I'm doing. I'm not happy with the travel that it requires. I'm not happy with the fact that I can't build meaningful relationships because I'm on the road so much. I'm a person that I don't even recognize sometimes because I'm not happy. And I started getting this idea that I needed to leave this place because mm -hmm. there was no way to do to, for me to reshape it. There mm -hmm. wasn't that opportunity. And so it took a lot of, uh, it took a lot of soul searching and a lot of you know, kind of inner reflection to get to that point. And I thought of it as my biggest failure because mm -hmm. everything that I worked hard for, this is what this firm represented, and I am going to leave it. It hasn't worked out. To me, it wasn't that firm's fault, it was my fault. I had failed at this. Mm -hmm. I had wanted this so badly, but I had failed at it. But I had, I mean, again, I was so unhappy, mm -hmm. I did not have another choice. Mm -hmm. And so, in leaving it, I mean, luckily, there is always another story. If you can kind of get through it again, mm -hmm. get through these failures and be willing to show up and be willing to, you know, kind of trust, you know, trust you know, internally that you'll, that you'll get past it. I mean, the reason leaving that job turned mm -hmm. out to be the best thing I could have ever done for my career. Because had I not left that job, I would have not found this other opportunity that led me to what I'm doing now. And what I'm doing now is so much closer to, mm -hmm. where, to my passion and to my purpose than that job could have ever been. Mm -hmm. I was just a cog in the wheel there. The stuff I do now, I mean, it's completely every, I can bring my whole self to my job. It's my, it's been my opportunity to be my most authentic self. And, but at the time, at the time, I did not know that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I thought it was a, a was a, a huge failure. Mm -hmm. Okay, last two questions. Um, all right, so we come to moments like this, you come to events like this, and oftentimes um, you hear a lot of the same stuff. I hope that you have heard new stuff today. But just in case, I happen to know that both of you have two ri really interesting ideas that I don't think I've ever heard before. So I'm going to ask you Pat first, and then I'm going to close out with you, James. So you have this idea and this notion of the winner's edit, which kind of piggybacks <laughs> off of the conversation we just had. Talk to me about what the winner's edit is. Yeah, so this is actually um, on the back of, um, of persistence and getting back up when, there's a, when you failed at something. So um, the idea in life is that you need to tell your own story. And in telling your story, you decide what you want to put in your story and the stuff you want to leave out of your story. It's actually akin to if you look at um, any of these, especially these reality shows you know, that have a contest or whatever, and you see the parts that they show you during the course of the series. By the time they get to the final episode, the person or the group that wins, it looks more like a coronation than like somebody that you're surprised about because all the steps along the way, you know, was edited to make that person or that group the winner. 
So you're editing, you know, the editors in the back room, they're keeping in the stuff that helps tell the story so that when that group or that person is eventually crowned, you think, oh, I saw it coming. The same way with the losers edit, right? You know, think about the villains in these, in some of these reality shows. Think about an Omarosa, if you will, right? <laughs> if you, you know, I guess you guys are old enough to know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you look at the edits on any of those shows, the stuff that was kept in there, she was the angry black woman. She didn't build consensus. So of course she was going to be the villain. And so anytime there's a movie and people in the media business or the movie business will tell you that the same story you can take the same storyline, the same screenplay, and you can make it either a sad story or you can make it a happy story. It's all about kind of the edits that you make, the music that you play. And so for you and for all of us, what you have to do, what's in common is that you do your own edits. And in that thing that was like, you know, like horrible and stuff, you know, you decide how you want to edit that and you make sure you're telling your story so that you're going to be the winner. Beautiful. I, um, in, the, in the branding conversation we had today, I mentioned a similar thought, which is I've always been taught and always tell people that the most important story we will ever tell is the story we tell ourselves about ourselves, right? And this is just a great reminder that you are 100% in, in control of that story that you are telling yourself. And so choose the winner's edit. Mm -hmm. All right, James, this one is completely out of left field for me, man. Um, I am hyper competitive. I, I hope it's not out of left field for me, <laughs> too. Okay. I'm hyper competitive. Yeah. Um, I hate to lose. I only want to play the game to win, period. Um, super competitive in all senses. And so I believe that we should all be striving to be number one all the time. You have a slightly different thought about winning every time in order to get to the ultimate win. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I'm hyper competitive too, <laughs> right? And I don't care if it's Sega hockey or, you know, game of horse. I want to win, right? But, you know, one of the things, remember I was saying earlier that my dad said, you know, you'll have great success one day when other people are so happy for your mm -hmm. success. Because then you have friends and you, you, you create even more strength. Mm -hmm. I've come to the thinking that uh, it, it involves being a fiduciary too, being a good parent or manager of money. Like if I man manage Pat's money, I have to put her interest before mine. Mm -hmm. Ashley Stewart, I put our customers' interests and my employees' interests before mine all the time. I never think, I don't have an office still because she doesn't care if I have an office, right? My customer, she doesn't care. So I have a desk. It's great. It's good enough for me. So. One of the things I've come to realize is that you can win like a decathlon and never win one of the 10 events. But if you finish in second place every single event of the 10, you can still win the gold medal. And I think about that. I'm like, OK, does that mean that I want to finish in second place? And that's not what I'm saying. It's can you win in a way you, quote, win, right? You are, quote, successful, broadly defined. But you can have 10 other people win, too. And I think if you can do that and have 10 awesome winners who then look to you and say, hey, we won, but you won, too. Yeah. And that's what I think a good mentor, a good investor does, is that a good teacher. <clears throat> you want your students to win. And by when they win, you win. Mm -hmm. But you win, too. It's not like it's completely charity. You do win, mm -hmm. too. You create that goodwill I talked about right, in class today. So anyway, so that, that's just a, yeah. it's a form of, I didn't think like this in my 20s. I think like this as I, as my kids are saying, I'm, I'm approaching the youth of old age. <laughs> That's what they say, <laughs> right? They say that I'm almost out of the old age of youth yeah. and close to the youth of old age. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. I don't know what that means, but I don't like it. <laughs> I think it's a really interesting idea because I think there's two things in it. One is the longer term view. 
right? So the ability to participate and to try to win and again, to not beat yourself up if you didn't come out on top, but then there's, uh, but know that you can still win in the long run. And then there's also this notion of who's winning with you, right? And who are you enabling, empowering to win along the way? I think so often, and you see it happen in minority communities, you know, we see a seat at the table and we think there's only one seat, right? And so we're fighting and kicking each other for that one seat. There's a really interesting notion that guess what? The whole table is empty, right? Or why don't you create the table and then create the space for mm -hmm. eight other people to sit there? Mm -hmm. And so I really like this idea because it brings the long-term thinking as well as the community thinking um, all at the same time. So I think I'm out of time. Yes, I'm getting ahead. Not so with that, I want to say um, thank you to this group of folks. So we're going to show them a and and we're going to do it for real. So, and I'm going to come down here with y'all. So to Pat, who is a wonderful, amazing lady, thank you for your time today. Let's give her some love. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To James, my brother from another mother, let's give him some love. And one last time for Ashley Stewart giving this scholarship the opportunity to win free $10,000. <laughs> and to Thank Gattavio. And to Come Gattavio. On. An amazing, amazing moderator here. Right. And so with that, I believe someone else is coming up here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a day. What an evening. Uh, this is so refreshing to not only hear great business and career advice, but such passionate discussion about such things as purpose in life fulfillment, uh, happiness, family, humility, the five Ps. Uh, we're, we're all so uh, grateful. I came here thinking this event would feed my head, but it fed my soul, and I hope it was the same for you uh, as well, no? Uh, I'm Todd Simmons. I'm the Associate Vice uh, Chancellor for University Relations for North Carolina A&T, uh, and it's my uh, great honor to be able to close our evening in thanks here tonight. On behalf of the university and our College of Business and Dean Beryl McEwen, who's seated uh, just over here, I want to express our deepest gratitude to our friends at Ashley Stewart, Newberger Berman, uh, Creme of Nature, I1 Digital, and One Solution, who have given so much of themselves, their time and their treasure, to make the Big Ideas Conference possible once again this year. Individually, I'd like to thank Ashley Stewart Marketing Director Erica Young, in the back of the room and her team, including the great professionals at 5W, Public Relations in New York, really for their tireless work in promoting and organizing today's sessions. Further, I'd like to thank Ashley Stewart, tile, uh, style expert Tamara Ivey, uh, style and beauty editor Danielle James of hellobeautiful.com. Where are you, Danielle? Yes. Uh, Dottavio Samuels, thank you for your moderation and for your participation in the panel this afternoon. And ANT alumna and model Erica Patrice. Erica, where? Oh, thank you. For that fabulous brand development workshop this afternoon. And a very special thanks to James Ree for his insightful private equity workshop earlier in the day. And let's have another round of applause, please, for James, for our incredible former Board of Trustees Chair and Newberger Managing, Newberger Berman Managing Director, Patricia Miller Zoller. Zoller? <laughs> Sorry. And for our panel moderator, Dittavio, for a really remarkable conversation this evening. I was there for part of the private equity workshop this afternoon. And in the midst of James Ree's discussion of assets, in front of about 125 fully engaged students. And when, in weather like this, it's tough to get people engaged on private equity. Uh, but they were riveted to that conversation. I heard him drive home a particular point in terms of how he values the assets in his own life. He said, I never put money ahead of people, he said, ever. It reminded me of something that James shared in Harvard Business Review and an influential and widely shared article on Ashley Stewart that he published in 2015. And if you haven't read this, you really must. It's a fabulous piece of writing and just inspirational. In discussing his interest in the company and his intent to lead it to success, he wrote, after listening to our customers, I came to realize that the brand stood for values like respect, empowerment, and joy. In tightly knit communities, shopping routines are interwoven amongst generations of women, oftentimes around important moments for them like church, 
family reunions, or a new job interview. In short, I felt Ashley Stewart stood for kindness and embodied our community. If you haven't read it, as I said, you really should. It's available online. Look it up. Our students, the thousands of people who have watched the stream this evening on Facebook Live, and we here this evening are fortunate today because the instruction and sharing we heard from James, Tamara, uh, Danielle, Dottavio, Erica, and Patricia wasn't just focused on bottom lines and profit margins, but on the values and personal principles necessary to succeed both in business and in life. This is a conference about big ideas, and those may, may be among the very biggest and most important. So thank you all for coming this evening, and please drive safely as you go home tonight. Good night. Yeah.